Hello and welcome to this video uh, on form analysis and systems analysis. Now I had originally promised to provide you with some uh, insights into how I research betting systems but I thought I would go a step further than that and actually add in some uh, some video content on how I read form as well. Um, I'm using uh, an example from stat of the day um, obviously it was a winning example um, to illustrate a number of the things that I look for in a possible bet um, and then I'm going on to look at uh, the Epsom Friday form analysis that I did recently um, to talk you through some of the things on there and how I find the information for that now that part of this video runs to about an hour in time so um, I make no apologies for that I don't think that you can disseminate uh, a serious amount of information in a few minutes and um, you know shortcuts in this context uh, generally have little utility um, so uh, it might be the case that you want to pause the video now and go and grab a cup of char uh, or coffee or wine or whatever your particular tipple is um, you'll probably want a notepad uh, and um, I hope you enjoy this video so as I say the first the first hour is on uh, form analysis the second part which is about half an hour in length is on specifically on systems analysis um, so if you do want to uh, um, fizz on past the form analysis part it's about at about the hour mark that um, start talking about systems analysis specifically um, anyway enough introductory rambling from me and um, on with the show <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to show you how I go about um, researching stat of the day um, entries. And um, in order to do this, I'm going to take you back uh, a few days. I'm probably going to spell this wrong to um, a horse that I nominated um, last week called Phidias or Phidias or something like that. Um, which won at Fakenham at 10 to 1. Um, now, its recent form figures, as you can see from the form string, if you ignore that one last time, its previous form figures were 3P344. So, um, not too much to get excited about. And you can also see that the horse hadn't won since um, way back on. Uh, where are we? the 4th of May 2010 which was um, basically two years almost exactly two years ago so um, <clears throat> the start point for these kind of things is I I start with the trainers um, for the day's racetracks I'm always interested in those trainers who perform well at particular tracks because um, trainers uh, are human and as a consequence of that they're creatures of habit which means that what what has worked for them well in the past is likely to be something that they'll um, they'll look to replicate in the future this is this is a, a pattern that we all do um, <clears throat> and it's why uh, if you talk to many people who are into betting they'll say that the reason they are is because very early on in their betting career um, they had a a good win or a positive betting experience and um, you know we, we, we spend a lot of time trying to replicate that even though it may have been just blind luck that um, that uh, offered us that opportunity in the first place in any case um, in the example of, of this race last week it was the, the, the race meeting I was looking at was Fakenham and um, uh, so I was looking at the Fakenham card now um, one of one of the trainers who stood out. Um, uh, in fact, I should show you how I do that. So I I use the racing post. I'm pretty sure I can do this, not logged in, um, which would help because then that will show you uh, essentially um, how it would be if you don't have a racing post membership, as most of you probably won't have. Um, so um, right, so I'm I'm logged out now. Uh, the first thing I do is I go to the cards section in the racing post and we can see um, 
under each meeting there are a series of options uh, the one I'm interested in is statistics uh, let's have a look at Fontwell today um, so I click on statistics and it brings up uh, various details on the race meeting um, including top jockey top trainer and top uh, owner now I'm interested in the in the trainer section and what I'm looking for is a combination of a decent strike rate and um, ideally a profit now if the strike rate is very good on a number of runners I might look for one with a slight loss like for instance Venetia Williams because it's probable that within that she has a profitable subset of her runners um, in any case um, I get the data from here and uh, so going back to my example from Fakenham um, that day uh, one of the trainers here was Mrs Pam Sly and um, here is what I would get if I clicked on uh, on her name in that list um, it, the, 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 uh, the presentation defaults to these uh, these details now if you click the statistics button um, at the bot in the bottom section it will bring you a list of the trainers performance by course uh, it normally defaults to flat uh, like so um, obviously we're interested in the trainers performance at the specific track that we're looking at that day so in this case it was Fakenham um, and I could look across and subdivide this by hurdles chase or national hunt flat now the race in question was a hurdle race and we can see that uh, the vast majority of Pam Sly's profit and um, uh, comes from hurdle races uh, so looking at her entries that day she had two runners entered one was in a novice hurdle and the other was in a uh, I believe a handicap hurdle um, yep a novice's handicap hurdle now I used a secondary tool um, called horseracebase.com which I'll come on to uh, shortly to establish um, the better option and I also looked at the deeper form of the two horses in question you can see here that the two horses in question were Arkane who finished fourth on his debut um, and the stat of the day selection that day Phidias who won at 10 to 1 um, so um, the first thing I'm looking at as I've said is trainer track form uh, which trainers perform particularly well at a given track and with which subset of their runners now this this goes back to the good old days when um, I was in charge of trainer track stats which was a product that I created back in 2006 um, so six years ago now and um, if you've been following my stuff for any length of time you'll know that I'm a, a massive fan of trainer habits um, uh, and when when things are going right for trainers when they're in form that this is this really is something that you can't ignore in your betting if you're not if you're not taking note of the trainers in form then you are missing a massive trick uh, so that's the first takeaway really is to look at trainer form and to look particularly at trainers who target certain types of race at certain tracks um, I think if you just incorporate that into your betting you'll already improve how you're performing up to now um, <clears throat> now of course it's all very well a trainer having um, a good historical record at a given racetrack but if the horse is decidedly unsuited then that's not really going to help matters very much so in the case of uh, Phidias um, or indeed any other potential stat of the day pick any other potential selection of any description the next thing I want to see is whether the horse has got any kind of form at either the the course or the distance or in the class ideally I'm looking for a combination of these things and that that gives me a feeling that you know um, although it's possible the horse will will continue to underperform because most of these horses are looking uh, I select her on the back of a losing run um, it, I'm looking for some reason to suggest that they might return to form today um, and that hints 
something else that I want to talk about, which is quite a big concept in America, but but not not quite so much over here just yet. And that's called back class, uh, which essentially means a horse that on his old form is capable of winning, um, but for whatever reasons has been running down the field recently. Now, often it's because a horse is, is either regressive or um, uh, just is too high in the handicap. But sometimes it can be the case that the horse is being run is not really being run on its merits i.e. it's being run over an inadequate trip or on ground that doesn't suit or over fences when it's a hurdler or vice versa there there are any number of ways that a trainer um, that a trainer may run a horse under suboptimal conditions now some of them do it because um, they don't really know what the optimal conditions are and some of them do it because uh, they specifically do know <laughs> what the optimum conditions are if that makes sense um, so it, it really is immaterial we, we're not trying to second guess why the trainers are doing it we're just trying to establish the pattern in the horse's previous form um, when related against today's conditions so again getting back to the case of uh, Phidias um, if the race was at Fakenham and it was over uh, three miles we can see that it was on good to firm ground and it was a class five race let me just open up the race results so you can see all of this so we can see it was a novices handicap hurdle a class five race good to firm and um, half a furlong short of three miles two miles seven and a half furlongs so those are the those are the conditions that I was looking to match in Phidias's previous history the first thing I do is click the wins button and find out where the horse has won before and immediately I see that notwithstanding the fact that the wins were in chase races this CH denotes a chase race his previous two wins were both at Fakenham so the horse obviously acts on the track now Fakenham is a is a bit of a quirky track it's a very tight track where the horses are almost always uh, on the turn um, it, it's it's very uh, small compact circular track and that doesn't suit all horses some ho some bigger horses like more galloping tracks because they get unbalanced or they can't find a rhythm on some of the smaller tracks so um, Fakenham is one of those tracks where course form is a is a quite a big plus because not all horses act around it um, <clears throat> it was also clear that the distance wasn't a problem uh, he won over a furlong further twice and it was further clear that the going wasn't a problem either in fact the fact that it was good to firm that day um, when I selected him was a positive bonus because you can see that his previous wins had been on good and good to firm ground um, you can also see that when he had won previously, albeit over fences, his official rating was 119 the second time in a class three race. Uh, and then last Sunday when he ran, he was rated 98 over hurdles in a class five race. Now some horses are just better chasers um, than they are hurdlers or vice versa. So it, it doesn't necessarily follow that the fact the horse was 21 pounds um, lower in the ratings uh, meant that he would run 21 pounds better or or was well in um it's it's just something you have to it's a bit of a feel thing you have to take it to some degree um uh on spec but the thing that really caught my eye about this was this last this last win that he had which was over three miles at faking him on good to firm he had not had those conditions collectively since and if we look at um, if we ignore his Stratford form which was pretty moderate but if we look at his other form on good or firm ground um, we can see we can see at Huntingdon he ran second on good ground now these are in these are in uh, chases bear in mind um, we can see fake enemy ran on on heavy ground which clearly wouldn't have suited uh, and ran down the field um, we can we we can see here he ran in a handicap chase he fell so it's difficult to he fell at the first in fact so we can't infer anything from that um, 
and then he ran again at faking him on soft um, and he ran he was beaten far enough 25 lengths on ground that wouldn't have suited class 4 um, he ran again faking him on good to soft ground that wouldn't have suited and then for the first time in a career that over um, over fences that had spanned 34 runs up to that point for the first time ever he was running in a class 5 race now he'd run he'd run at that level on the flat in three starts on the flat way back when um in fact a few more than that but um but over over fences or hurdles this represented a dropping class for the horse and it was also the first time that he had had proper fast ground at fakenham which was that was the key for me to selecting this horse was that something today was sparking him back to uh, previous former glories, let's call them, <laughs> relatively at least. So um, I was happy enough to take a chance with a horse like that. And it's important to know that when you're backing horses at 10 to 1 or 8 to 1 or even 6 to 1 because you think they're value, that it still means that in the main they're going to get beaten. Right, so a ten to one shot that I think should be about a four to one or ninety two shot represents a great bet, but still four times out of five it's going to get beaten, and um you have to have quite a lot of faith and confidence in your selection process to to carry on picking those horses, for instance, today, I selected a horse called um uh, Silver Accord at Fontwell, which had a similar profile in terms of the trainer's form at the track and back class um, and a return to optimal conditions today the horse ran a stinker um, and that's fine you know the, the, this is the way I bet and it's it's what I'm trying to to demonstrate here it's about profit not winners so if I have to wait five losers to back an eight or ten to one winner and I can re replicate that over a number of hundreds of bets I know I'm going to win maybe 30% on my stake right that's a kind of an extreme example but the principle holds true you've got to be prepared to back horses at prices that still mean they're more than likely to get beaten but in the long run you're going to get paid out and come in front come out in front I hope that makes some sort of sense I appreciate it was a little bit um, garbled in places maybe but the point is we're looking for a reversion to a previous level of form that a horse has demonstrated. I'm not looking for a horse with potential here because I find that generally the market overcompensates for potential, especially with horses from the bigger stables. So you actually get a shorter price than you should do. A great example of this um, was a horse that ran in the first race at Epsom on Oaks Day called Laytime, trained by uh, Andrew Balding, who has an excellent record, record at the tra track. Um, uh, the stable love this horse and they really think that he's going to be a pretty good animal in the future. And the market reflected that. He went off shorter than two to one in the end. Uh, he, got beat, he got well beaten in the end and it, it may well have been the track didn't suit. It might be that he's not quite good enough for that level yet. It doesn't matter. Um, the point is, I would never have been backing that horse shorter than two to one um, when he had to progress and step up considerably on what he'd done previously. The horse was no value, in other words. And um, this, this concept of value, which is kind of intangible, a little bit ethereal, is something that I will keep coming back to. Um, it means different things to different people or rather it's it's quantified in different ways by different people and um, and that's fine actually that's part of the the richness of the sport um, but you need to be backing horses where you think their actual chance of winning the race where you think their actual chance of winning the race is greater than the odds imply okay so that's um probably a little bit labored but i hope you uh i hope you get the gist of that right so that's that's really how i look at start of the day um i'm looking for trainer form 
uh, at the track. I'm looking for horse form at the track and also um, on the prevailing going conditions and in the class. And I'm looking for an indication from the horse that previously he's been able to acquit himself uh, very well. In fact, he's been able to win under the conditions of today's race. Um, and uh, if I can if I can find a way to link a number of the poorer performances in the recent past, uh, for instance, unsuitable going or distance or course constitution or whatever, then so much the better. Those are the horses that I look to back and I consider them to be value plays. And um, generally, they start shorter than they are uh, in the morning odds. All right, so that was um, the start of the day. Now let's have a look at the Epsom uh, analysis that I did. This is this is how I um, break down a major race meeting. Here's the post that I uh, wrote. I say wrote. Um, there weren't actually too many words in the post because uh, I was in a bit of a rush. So what I ended up doing was taking a picture of my notes um, uh, from the Oaks Day. Uh, races to um, to show you my workings out if you like and there are a number of elements that I look at um, when cons when uh, framing up a race card so and these elements kind of they can be broken down into two uh, separate uh, sections the first one is the macro if you like the holistic picture which is things that relate for instance to the course and its constitution whether it favors uh, pacemakers or closers or prominent runners um, just as a point of interest very few tracks favor closers and if you habitually back horses that you that um, that need to be held up uh, <laughs> you are habitually going to be cursing your luck because these horses either finish very fast but never quite get there or they get caught in their run on the flat a lot of bad things can happen to hold up horses so um, again if if your style of betting is to back these horses or if you don't even know what their run style is then um, the first thing you need to do is look in the racing post at their last three runs and see if they're hold up horses I tend to um, as far as possible uh, avoid hold up horses. The only time I really think about backing a hold up horse is in a race where I can see there's a lot of pace uh, and there's every likelihood that the race that the pace will collapse in front and um, something will come from off the pace to win the race. But even then, I'm um, I tend to be reluctant to back closers or horses that are held up habitually. Um, that's personal preference, um, but I I found it works well for me. So also in the um, in the macro context, I'm interested in the specific race conditions, um, the going, the distance, and the class. Uh, and then once I once I understand the specific conditions of today's race, I'll start to look at the the micro picture, if you like, the trainer form relating to the horses in each race, um, specifically their recent form and track form, as I've referred to already. Um, and then obviously I need to look at the horses themselves, um, their course form, which uh, is definitely more important on quirky tracks like um, faking them in the example I used already and here at Epsom where it's a real helter skelter track um, and course form is a definite positive. Uh, I'm interested in um, previously favoured conditions. Uh, I will also consider horses that have got scope for improvement for today's conditions although as I've said already um, that can be over factored into the price if, if I consider if I think that a horse if it's for instance if it's all over the media that a horse should improve for a step up in trip or such like um, I'm probably either going to leave the race alone or look to back something against it because um, the price of the horse will already be over um, will, will will represent no value on the basis that you know it, people in the pub will be saying to their mates oh yeah he's bound to bound to improve for a step up step up in trip because they've read it somewhere not because they believe that necessarily or that they know it from the breeding or whatever um, and it's this kind of 
following the crowd mentality that costs a, a lot of punters a lot of money. Now, if you're a fun punter and you just want to back uh, a couple of horses that have been tipped up by uh, Templegate in the sun or whatever, I've got no problem with that. Um, uh, absolutely fine. Uh, Templegate is actually a pretty good tipster um, uh, relative to other newspaper tipsters. But you must know that whatever those guys put up, um, their horses are going to generally not be very good value. So um, it, if you have any uh, aspirations to make money from betting on horses, then you need to be ignoring newspaper tips and you need to be pretty much ignoring the betting until you've come to a conclusion on the race. Um, if you can price up races, uh, if you can create your own odds line, then that's even better. And we'll, we'll perhaps talk about creating odds lines another day. Um, but that's, you know, th that, that's how you can uh, frame the concept of value is if you have if you can make your own odds line and compare the price of the actual price of the horses with the price that you believe they should be um, then you're you're in a very good position to identify value okay so that's um, uh, my usual long-winded summary of the situation now let's actually have a look at some of these notes and um, and uh, I'll show you where I found the data for them and the tools that I use um, when analysing a card. Um, now I'm going to have to play around with my screen a little bit here to try and make this fit. Uh, let me see what's going on here. Right. Okay. Hopefully you can sort of see that. Um, in fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it even bigger uh, so that you can definitely see it. Right, so um, this was Epsom on Friday so the first things we know um, are that Epsom has a very curious constitution it's a remarkably idiosyncratic track um, it runs uphill and downhill it runs it swings um, right to left around uh, Tattenham Corner um, it has a reverse camber which means as horses should be lugging in around that bend the um, the ground actually falls away from them so it, it forces them to swing out wide and there is a there is a um, a right to left, sorry, a left to right as you look towards the winning line. Um, the ground falls away from left to right, so horses actually start rolling around uh, in the last quarter mile, which is also downhill. It's actually a hell of a hell of a quirky track, and you very often get hard luck stories there, or horses that don't act on it. So, as I say, course form. Um, is uh, is a real positive. The other thing to say about Epsom is it definitely favours those who can race close to the pace. Um, so those are the things that I was bearing in mind when framing uh, my views on the racing. The next thing I'll do if it's a big meeting, if it's a group race or such like, is I'll look at the trends for race. I'll look at what sort of a profile fits that particular race. Um, now in the case of the first race at Epsom, which I believe was the Princess Margaret Stakes, a Group 3 race uh, for fillies and mares, um, there were some reasonable trends to, to um, consider. First of all, uh, four trainers had between them won 11 of the last 15 uh, uh, iterations of it. So I've been Saroor, Mick Channon, Sir Michael Stout and John Dunlop. Um, unfortunately, none of them had a <laughs> had a runner, so that kind of kiboshed that idea straight away. Um, but looking away from uh, the personnel, uh, we could see that it was a race that generally favoured the top end of the market, with 14 out of 15 winners being seven to one or shorter, um, and that that kind of aligning with the fact that um, all bar three of the last 15 winners had finished in the frame last time out. Um, the f 
the four and five year olds uh, held sway with a few three year old winners as well nothing older than five had ever won the race so again you know it tends to be the case with fillies and mares that by the time they're six or older if they're any good they've gone off to the paddocks um for breeding so um that sort of that logically follows uh, and again with the fact that so many were seven to one or shorter it was no surprise to find that eight were favorite three were second favorite and three the other three were um uh third or fourth favorite uh it was interesting to me that most of them had run within a month um and there was a ratings band as well that was of interest so i all 15 winners had been rated 100 plus or were yet to get a rating so I immediately put a line through anything rated less than 100 and there were about three in this race as I recall um, I then looked at the pace angle uh, and I established that the likely pacemaker was clinical and he w was pro probably going to get sorry she was probably going to get her own way in front as she was the only one who habitually uh, front runs so um, those other four mentioned there numbers one four five and seven were can race close to the pace so I was interested in those uh, as well from from uh, from a course constitution perspective um, let me show you the two tools that I use to do this because I appreciate that I'm really just talking about um, um, history uh, thus far and I do want to uh, give you an insight into the tools that I use. So the first tool that I use on a very regular basis is a brilliant um, uh, database called Horse Race Base. Now, if you haven't seen this or used it, um, it's run by a top man called Chris Bagnall. Um, and uh, it's hugely affordable. As you can see, my last donation was seven and a half euros. Um, uh, which is about um, six quid at the moment and that's per month so you know it's sort of uh, 20p a day or something and um, there is a massive amount of data in here um, you can create your own systems and it will tell you the qualifiers each day uh, you could it's got race card analysis uh, some really interesting stuff on race cards actually for instance let's have a look at um, uh, the 530 at Fontwell you can see it's got all these different analysis tools so you've got the, the normal race card there with um, uh, with horse race bases um, <clears throat> ratings their own ratings um, I can look at a glance at which horses have performed on today's going uh, and I can see that the one that Cornet likes the ground fast uh, seems to have done well on fast ground uh, I can see which ones are suited by the trip um, of two and a half miles um, and again I can see that Cornet has run quite well under those conditions um, in fact nothing else has won over two and a half miles um, although Airedale Lad has won over longer and shorter uh, I can look at the trainer and the jockey I can see if the horse has run at the track before and if so how it's done again Cornet is a course winner here so is what's for T um, uh, horses that have run well on similar tracks track conditions are here or going the same way uh, I can look at field size and odds I, I often look at the class element to see um, which horses have won in today's class again Cornet scores well um, Airedale Lads won plenty of times albeit from plenty of runs and um, I, I, I look at the headgear one as well I think this is quite interesting to see um, uh, how horses have performed under to, with today's headgear and what I can immediately see there is that um, Cornet it looks like he's trying cheek pieces for the first time um, because he's got a naught there for cheek pieces and tongue tie so that's that's quite interesting because it does imply that they're trying something different um, in any case the tongue ties worked well for him before uh, and finally there's a head-to-head -head view so you can see um, which horses have run well against which others uh, in this particular case there aren't many races to um, to look at so it's kind of immaterial but often you'll find a horse that's run against eight of his opponents and he's beaten seven of them and you know there are there are kind of in intra-class bands and if you get a horse 
that has beaten a number of the horses that he's racing against today, I always look on that as a positive. Uh, in any case, that that that's just one of the things in here. I, I mean, I, I could spend an hour showing you around Horse Race Base and really only scratch the surface with it. It's a fantastic tool. And um, if you go to horseracebase.com forward slash ggs.php, um, I'll put this link under the video. Just make a note of that. you can get a, uh, a free week's trial to use this you just um, register and uh, I've arranged it with Chris that you can have a free week there's no there's, there's no affiliate link on my part or anything like that it's just um, I, I personally think that um, horse race base is the most accessible uh, entry level um, research tool that you can use and um, at, at, when, I'm, when I say accessible I mean for six pounds a month or seven seven euro fifty a month. It's really um, tremendous value. Uh, okay, um, so the thing that I wanted to show you actually in regards to the big races is one of the research tools is is uh, trends um, profile. So the, where I get all my out of fifteen, uh, ten out of fifteen, and so on information is from um, from this. So I select the track Epsom and the month June, and there are. Uh, it brings up the major races um, uh, in the month. In actual fact, that race is called the Princess Elizabeth Stakes, not the Princess Margaret Stakes. Um, and by clicking on that and then using the Profiler tool, I get a breakdown of um, stalls for flat races, um, where horses finished on their previous race, uh, what odds bracket they were in, the horse's age, uh, their their weight, which is not which is relevant in handicaps more so than in um, group and listed races or conditions races, uh, market position, their official handicap rating, um, how long it was since they ran, and um, and how many runs they've had in the last year. Now, some of this data will be more meaningful than other elements. For instance, I thought that um, the fact that a horse had run in the previous 30 days uh, and 10 of the last 16 now um, <clears throat> had done that I thought that was very interesting and that was a factor that I brought into play um, the fact that those runners who were rated less than 100 had never won the race from probably 30 tries um, that's material to me and uh, and so on there is a degree of inference of course there is and um, you know, we have an obligation to use statistics uh, sensibly um, just because, for instance, um, we could say that uh, 5, uh, 10, 15 of the last 16 winners of this race were drawn still 7 or lower. Now, the fact of the matter is that, that the biggest field has been 10. <laughs> so it stands to reason that the lower drawn horses are going to win more often. Stool one has failed to win in those sixteen runs. Now that's just a coincidence stat. You know, there's there's nothing there's no reason why stool two would have won twice and stool one would not have won at all. Um, it, it just doesn't make any logical sense. So um, there's some tremendous data here, but you have to be careful about how you use it. You've got to think, right, is what what's the reason behind that? What why would it be that stool one um, hasn't produced a winner and if you can't come up with a logical explanation then you shouldn't be using that data so um, to extend that uh, again in the case of the official ratings um, why am I happy to exclude any horse rated below a hundred well basically because this is a group three race and it takes a horse rated roughly a hundred or more to win a group three race and um, if you're rated for instance 89 or 90 or 95 you're probably not good enough and this is backed up by the place statistics as well as you can see you know when we get above 100 there are a lot of placed horses here but as soon as we duck below that just in the high 90s there's a few but there's only one horse rated um, below 95 to even place from what is that 16 
three places 16 times so out of 48 possible places only one horse rated below 95 has hit the frame and that makes perfect sense right so so there's some great data here but use it sensibly um, there are lies damn lies and statistics and people people tend to abuse the data sometimes and then one and then start saying oh well trends are no good trends are good but they're, but they're only as good as um, the people who infer the data okay uh, off my hobby horse again and um, the other tool that I've been using recently and again uh, I'm hoping to do something with uh, the guy who runs this product in the future is something called Proform now Proform is a pretty powerful and amazing tool with an incredible um, depth to it uh, I don't I, I don't it's not the job of today's video to um, to show you just how powerful it is I just want to touch on a couple of factors with it um, in fact only one really and that that is um, I use this primarily to look at the pace angle you can see down the left hand side all the um, all the array of elements that it's got and, I'll, and we'll talk about this another day it's got a great system builder tool um, it's got various ways of um, analyzing the draw managing your bets uh, tracking horses that you want to follow and so on but but the, the thing that's really interesting to me is the pace form angle and so for any race that you you select in um, pro form in this case it's the 210 at Utoxeter um, it brings you a course and distance pace statistics box. Now, this is these are all the races that have been run at Utoxeter um, over where are we? Over two miles on the hurdles course, and we can see that of 545 front running horses, um, 103 of them won, and that generated a profit at SP of 90 pounds. Um, and has an impact value of over two. Now this impact value is important because it means it, it, it's a reference to the statistical significance of the numbers. Um, uh, an impact value of one is kind of the normal distribution. Anything above one is above average and anything above two um, with a material sample size like this is, um, is an important factor. So in this case we can see that horses that lead um, uh, are clearly favoured. Those that race prominently, although they lose a uh, significant sum at SP, they are still favoured statistically um, over, over th they perform above average but not sufficiently well to make a profit um, backed blindly. And we can see <clears throat> that hold up horses are at a massive disadvantage. We can see 165 winners from nearly 3,000 runners um, and an impact value well below one. So um, again, you know, this is this is testament to the fact that hold-up horses uh, find it very difficult to close down and pass all of the horses that are in front of them. Um, uh, this this act, this shape here of um, horses that lead being particularly favoured, those racing prominently being partially favoured, and those being held up. Uh, being uh, significantly disadvantaged is quite a common pattern and it certainly was the case at Epsom so again I'm I'm putting added focus on those horses that um, are going to race close to the front so this is when we wh when we look at the actual runners in the race we can see that um, that a horses however many runs are listed with their run style now an H uh, in, implies held up an L implies lead, and a P implies prob uh, prominent. So lead, prominent, held up, right? And we can see that um, this the, the list is um, uh, sorted on pace percentage. Now this is as a in actual terms, um, it, you get uh, I, I can't remember what it is. I think it's four points for an L, two points for a P, and no, none for an H. So in this case, you've got L, L, P. So that's four plus four plus two is ten, right? So you can see in you can see in individual terms, this horse is ten, ten points, ten points, eight points. But that 
doesn't necessarily mean very much. However, when it's quantified in a percentage terms, as in 10 equals 16% of all of the pace points in the race, we can get a feel for the shape of the race. And we can see that it's probable that these three horses, Onkey, Western Approaches and Irish Symphony, between them are going to lead. Um, if we see a lot of horses that want to lead, then that tells us that the race is probably going to be pretty fast run and um, and it could set up for a closing horse to perform well. Now in this in this particular race there's quite an even distribution of pace so um, I wouldn't be favouring a prominent runner <clears throat> or, or a hold up horse. I, I think you know I think there will be some there would have been some speed in the race um, but not not a disastrous amount. Um, compare that then with uh, our where are we? With our um, our notes on the first race at Epsom, and we can see that clinical. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I can't show you in pro form because the day has passed. But we can see from my notes that clinical was the only probable race leader in the early stages. The horse was sure to be prominent in the race, um, as that's how she had always run. And um, in a small field uh, such as there was that day, um, she represented uh, a good chance of getting out in front and staying out in front. And as it turned out, that's pretty much what happened. Um, if I can just uh, get the result here, just bear with me. Now the other one that I noted uh, was lay time. That horse ended up being favourite and um, and really uh, quite significantly overbet. As I say, it was a case of um, it became a bit of a momentum horse in the betting, and um, uh, went off a far shorter price than than really its um, its course form uh, suggested it should have done so it opened up seven to four having been nine to four and five to two in the morning and actually went off the 13 to eight favorite um, we, she was well beaten and, and Andrew Boulding her trainer said that she didn't act on the track um, I think that's probably true um, but you know if you want to if you want to bet a horse at 13 to eight or two to one that has that doubt about it then you're not factoring in much contingency into the price. By contrast, if you back a horse at seven to one and it doesn't act on the track, you can say, well, okay, but you know, that the fact that she might not act on the track was factored into her price. She was a front runner, so she had every, she didn't have to worry about other horses around her. In actual fact she did have one horse in front of her, but you can see she chased the clear leader, she was ridden to lead two furlongs out and kept on well. Um, she's always going to be out, out of trouble and another thing about Epsom is um, horses can find trouble in running. If you saw the Oaks, the Fug had a ter terrible run, so did Maybe. Um, a number of others were uh, compromised in their run by um, the course constitution and the size of the field. So these are things that over time you will gain experience of and um, and uh, you'll factor into the betting. Basically, betting a horse at 13 to 8 or 2 to 1 on potential rather than form in the book is a very, very dangerous game. And, um, you know, I would rather have less winners at bigger prices um, if I have to take uh, so much on trust because I can't see it in the form book. So that, that was one example um, uh, from the Epsom card. And maybe I can just do one more before we... Um, uh, well, let's look at the second race in point of fact because that was um, that was an interesting race too. Now, I th this was a case where uh, I let a winner pass me by in the end. In in fact, I actually laid the winner of this race. So if I just zoom this up a bit, um, let me see if I can make this legible for you. Okay, so you can see there are a few stats here. Um, eight out of the last ten were four or five years old. Um, 
the same number were carrying nine stone or more. In fact, most of those six out of ten were carrying between nine stone and nine stone five, um, uh, implying that they had some some class, but they weren't overburdened by weight. Um, the same number were towards the top end of the market. There was one big outsider, 40 to 1 shot, but mostly they were um, uh, relatively favoured horses. And again, I've got the pace angle here. Uh, I've got 2 and 7 leading um, with 5, 12 and 13 close up and the rest coming from off the pace. Um, there were a couple of horses who... Uh, who um, uh, had particularly good Epsom form and that's always a bonus round here so Research um, had run seven times at Epsom previously three wins and two places um, meant he was one to uh, keep an eye on he went up five to one second favourite in the end which is a bit short for me uh, Ramona Chase had had 18 previous runs at Epsom and placed seven times including in this race in the past um, so I was I, I, I want I want to keep those kind of horses on side. I want to be aware of that. And then um, when I was looking at the class angle, the horses to consider in that context, the ones who had um, won in this class, this was a class two handicap, as I remember, yep, over a mile and a quarter, were Rum, Black Spirit, Gatewood and Borug. Um, now, as it happened, Gatewood won the race and Borug was third, I think. Um, I ended up backing Rum in the end, which is a Godolphin horse that had, she had been a, a pacemaker for Blue Bunting in a lot of her races. But before that, she had won a listed race in um, uh, she had won a listed race over a mile and a quarter, which was the trip of today's race. Um, the other thing I had noted with Gatewood, um, as I go small screen again, um, was that. Gatewood will need luck in running, but is progressive. Rum takes a massive drop in class after being Blue Bunting's pacemaker. Previously a listed winner, conditions, a mile and a quarter and fast ground, are ideal for her. So, um, I backed Rum, and I was interested in Gatewood, despite the fact that he, he I felt he'd need luck in running. Now, if you saw this race, it was a quite... Uh, a quite remarkable race um, in as much as Gatewood came from an impossible position to win going away and was hugely impressive um, to my mind he was uh, he is at least a group 3 horse um, running in handicaps Now the fact that he only won by a neck means that the handicapper can't really do too much for him and I gather that the plan for him is to go for a handicap at Royal Ascot rather than a group race and um, John Gosden, Johnny G has a great record with uh, Royal Ascot handicaps he used to get Franny Norton on his lightweights there um, and particularly for George Strawbridge those those three connections um, have had some great some great days at Royal Ascot now I don't know who will be riding, I guess Buick will be riding um, uh, Gatewood at Royal Ascot unless he can't do the weight um, but this horse is very much one to keep on side and if you look if, if you look at the actual uh, race result um, I laid the horse because I thought 9-4 to four in a field of however many it was um, 13 was just way too short a price because based on the fact that his run style um, meant that he ha he would probably have to over come bad luck in running and that a lot of improvement was factored into um, his price now you can see that he actually opened up three to one and was backed all the way into nine to four so there was a lot of confidence in him but look at the racing comment held up in rear still plenty to do and not clear run over two furlongs out switch right and headway over a furlong out strong run final furlong to lead close home and he won by a neck and a neck. In actual fact, if you um, if we go back to my notes and look at the horses and mention from a class angle, um, we picked out. If I can get this um, screen to behave itself, the class horses were Rum, Black Spirit, Gatewood, and Barug. 
and then if we look at the result we can see that Gatewood, Baruga and Black Spirit were three of the first four home despite the fact that two of them were 10 to 1 and 20 to 1 respectively so again don't be afraid to back a horse at a price because the market can't can't factor everything in and if you're looking at a certain angle you may be you maybe have access to something or you place more um, credence or weight on a factor that the market doesn't and and one of the greatest lessons that anyone can ever learn and um, for the more experienced of you forgive me for teaching grannies to suck eggs um, but one of the greatest lessons that you can ever learn is to trust your own judgment ignore the newspapers ignore ignore the tipsters trust your own judgment um, and and you will be you will be rewarded in due course uh, and again you know this is an example of that here that three of the four class horses in the race finished first third and fourth um, one of them at 20 to 1 another one at 10 to 1 um, so go with your own mind don't be ashamed of that right enough already that that then is um, a little insight into um, some of the key elements of uh, my own form analysis. Uh, as you can tell, there are a number of kind of mechanical elements, if you like, for, in terms of the um, uh, the statistical angle, and the the form analysis can be written up into a method. Um, and then there's a piece of inference on my part which is based on knowledge and experience which um, everybody can gain over time about course constitutions and um, and the like so that concludes this part of the video um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to replenish my teacup and return for part two which will be um, the, the previously promised session on how to research betting systems. Okay, that's it for now. I'll talk to you soon. Hello and welcome to this video uh, on form analysis and systems analysis. Now I had originally promised to provide you with some uh, insights into how I research betting systems but I thought I would go a step further than that and actually add in some uh, some video content on how I read form as well. Um, I'm using uh, an example from stat of the day um, obviously it was a winning example um, to illustrate a number of the things that I look for in a possible bet um, and then I'm going on to look at uh, the Epsom Friday form analysis that I did recently um, to talk you through some of the things on there and how I find the information for that. Now that part of this video runs to about an hour in time so um, I make no apologies for that. I don't think that you can disseminate uh, a serious amount of information in a few minutes and um, you know shortcuts in this context uh, generally have little utility um, so uh, it might be the case that you want to pause the video now and go and grab a cup of char uh, or coffee or wine or whatever your particular tipple is um, you'll probably want a notepad uh, and um, I hope you enjoy this video so as I say the first the first hour is on uh, form analysis the second part which is about half an hour in length is on specifically on systems analysis um, so if you do want to uh, um, fizz on past the form analysis part it's about at about the hour mark that um, start talking about systems analysis specifically um, anyway enough introductory rambling from me and um, on with the show Okay, so this is um, <clears throat> part two of the video, which is going to be uh, how to research your own betting systems. Um, I'm kind of filming this um, hand to face, uh, hopefully it's pointing roughly in my direction. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to show you the first element of what we do, or what I do certainly, is um, I start with an angle, um, some kind of idea of... Um, what might make a good system. Uh, it might be trainer based, it might be form based, it might be something I hear on the radio or read in a book. And um, just let me exemplify that with uh, some of my 
uh, data sources, let's call them, in my very cramped uh, study. So the first thing I have is a wonderful plastic bag full of old odds on magazines. Now you probably can't read this but um, these things are full of, this one's called alternate, alternative handicapping techniques and um, they're full of data and ideas. Uh, my thanks to Jim Cannon uh, for providing me with that, Councillor Jim, top man. Next thing I've got is um, uh, probably a fairly enviable bookshelf um, with just stacks of racing books from both home and abroad. Um, they're kind of falling off, you know, they're, they're literally everywhere. There's one more up there, the perfect punter. And, um, just, just stacks and stacks of racing books. I love racing books. And the third thing on my desperately cramped uh, uh, desk space, I'm not the tidiest worker, is um, uh, something called the Betting Insiders Club Members Report, which has got some great data and ideas in there. This, this one is um, Spring National Hunt Sire Analysis. Um, I think there's an article there by David Renham of um, Racing Trends. And so it goes on. I've also got um, Racing Ahead magazine, which I'm looking forward to reading when I get a chance. Um, and these are some of the some of the uh, tools that are available. Uh, I'll show you a few online ones as well. Um, but I just I just wanted to um, the, the the key point here is read more. Um, if you're interested in racing and turning a profit, then read um, publications by by those guys who um, who. Uh, write and research such things, uh, pick up ideas from them, and um, and you know take them and run with them, take them to the next stage, and that's essentially what I'm going to do in the rest of this video. So um, enough said, and now let's uh, go back over to the computer. So the principal tool that I use for um, researching betting systems and angles these days is horseracebase.com now um, in the past I've used uh, a number of others I used to love racing systems builder unfortunately that's no longer supported um, there was one called adrianmassey.com which uh, many of you will remember fondly and there are a number of others as well the one the one I like um, is horseracebase.com and um, I, I mentioned earlier in the video or in part one of this video um, about how you can uh, get access to this um, you can try it for free and the way to do that is to go to horseracebase.com forward slash ggs dot php if you press uh, if you go to that page then you see it's a free trial for ggs customers you get seven days to play around with this um, and when your trial expires, you can donate to continue your access. Um, Chris is a great guy. He doesn't even send marketing emails to his list, let alone uh, share it with other people. So you can be sure that your um, that your details will be kept in the um, utmost security. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, you'll get seven days to try this out. It's a really great tool, which I use every day. Um, so let me show you how I research systems on it. I'll log back in again. Um, right, so um, <clears throat> amongst all this wondrous stuff uh, in the various drop downs is uh, a tool called System Builder, and this is the one I use. So I'm going to click that, and um, it brings up a screen that looks like this. This now there are a very large number of variables. Firstly, relating to the race, the, the race um, kind of in, in terms of what I've been talking about, relating to the macro, if you like. So this stuff talks about um, time of year, uh, track, um, uh, race category and class and so on. So the high, the high level angles and then uh, several of the other boxes then go on to talk about the horse itself and its performance in recent runs. Uh, as well as its characteristics, uh, weight, official rating, um, sex, and so on. 
further down there are sections for jockeys and trainers um, and then still further down uh, you can look at horses um, last second last third last fourth last uh, run and also its last winning run and as if all that wasn't enough um, for those of you that are interested in such things uh, you can also look at uh, you can do um, stallion uh, uh, pedigree research now in my opinion um, although it doesn't massively fascinate me um, I do think that there is an opportunity around um, breeding uh, the, the breeding of horses and understanding um, horse preferences based on um, on the sire sire data I think that's a pretty good angle in um, like I say it's not something I've ever done anything with because I uh, I find it a bit dry for my tastes but I, I do believe that there's merit in um, in performing some sort of analysis on that anyway um, these are all the elements and I'm going to show you by example uh, how I use this now as I said the first thing is to come up with an angle and um, uh, recently I came up with um, uh, I read a piece of research which kind of supported a theory that I already had about um, Irish Raiders in handicap hurdles at the Cheltenham and Aintree Fest festivals so they seem to be um, they seem to be burgling a lot a lot of the prizes and I had actually uh, I wrote a piece on this about um, well probably after the 2011 Cheltenham Festival so just over a year ago um, and more recently than that I decided that I'd delve into it a bit deep bit more deeply um, so um, here's how I would have researched that I, I have this actually set up as a system in my um, my systems now I have a, a number that are on the the incubator um, some of them have made it into Betfolio some of them may make it into standalone products at some point I always test my systems in the in the live environment before um, offering them to uh, prospective clients some of them um, would never make commercial systems because they're they had their long the losing runs are too long um, that or for some other reason um, that might mean they don't have mass appeal maybe um, if if more than a few people were backing them the price the price would um, wouldn't be supported on Betfair or whatever so um, it doesn't necessarily follow that a system that works for you personally will be one that um, could be considered as a commercial system uh, for various reasons for those of you who may either have your own system that you'd like to commercialize or be interested in researching one okay so um, assuming that made any sense <laughs> whatsoever let's push on right so my starting point was um, that I was interested in uh, handicaps at Cheltenham or Aintree um, handicap hurdles so I select track handicap or non handicap and hurdles chases national and flat so let's just use those three initially and I click go at the bottom and then that will bring up a list of variables for each of those elements <clears throat> so um, Aintree and Cheltenham those are the main UK national hunt festivals um, and uh, then I can select handicap here and uh, hurdles so now I'm looking at handicap hurdles at Aintree and Cheltenham I click go so that then creates a subset and here are my here are my criteria on the right hand side um, uh, that that creates a subset um, now one of the theories around why the Irish horses seem to perform well um, and I think it has quite a lot of merit particularly in the last couple of years um, is that the horses they tend to run on very deep ground in Ireland um, oftentimes throughout the national hunt season over in Ireland the ground will be soft or heavy um, in the vast majority of occasions and um, not all not all horses are suited by that so if you've got a horse that is running on unsuitable ground and running down the field as a consequence its handicap mark will only go one way and that is south so um, 
that 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 does two things firstly it puts the horse on an attractive mark um for when it comes over for a for a big uh, race in britain and secondly uh it um it conveniently hides the horse's ability from the general public meaning that the price of the horse is uh, rewarding for those of us who think a little more laterally than looking for a one or a two next to its name from last time out so um that being the case we we need a situation where um we we're looking at a horse that's running on quick ground because you know the perception is that um w one of the key one of the key factors in the horse performing better is a reversion <clears throat> excuse me a reversion to faster ground so if i go back to my quick set uh and this is where i can quickly add a um a parameter then i'm going to select going there and i'm going to go down to the bottom and i'm going to go with um good good to firm firm uh, and in fact I'm going to put good to soft in there as well because Cheltenham often report the going as good to soft even though the race time suggests it's probably good to firm so um, that's infuriating but but we, we've got to go we've got to go with um, with uh, the way things are um, and of course we're talking about uh, Irish trained horses so actually I should have just put in um, one of the uh, variables under um, under trainer is trainer primary location and from here we can choose the Irish uh, counties or provinces so um, it's basically Leinster, Munster, Connacht and Ulster now I don't know if that's all of them or not but it's certainly all of the Irish uh, options tick box options on here and I click go um and um I'm just gonna put the year in. So what I normally do with the year is um when I'm when I'm testing an idea, I don't I don't want to have all of the years in in a in a an in an array that I'm ultimately gonna use. So for instance, um if I want to test over the last five years, what I'll tend to do is perhaps select two or three of the most recent years, and I'll leave the very most recent, the, the most recent, and I'll leave one of the older ones as well, because I don't, I don't want to create a situation where I'm being led by the data, if that makes sense. I don't, I don't want the tail to wag the dog. Um, I, I want to find a pattern within a subset of the years that I then latterly discover is replicated uh, in the other years. So what I'll do is I'll test it on two of the years data and if it looks good and sensible and bear in mind all of this has got to be sensible and logical then I'll extrapolate by adding in the other years subsequently 2009, 2012 for instance. But to begin with, I'm going to use a subset of the available data to set things up. So I've chosen 2010, 11 there. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm, going to, I'm going to run the query there. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. And now what we can see um, uh, straight away is that um, we, if we had... If we had used this um, in those two years, 2010 and 11, we can see we'd have had 11 winners from 90 runners, which is only a 1 in 8 strike rate. It's not fantastic. Um, and they're placing about the same again, making it a 1 in 4 place strike rate. We can click on the each way button and see how we'd have got on if we'd backed these horses each way. And we can see that our, um, our 40 and a half point profit becomes... 47 points uh, if backed each way that's with a minimum of five runners now most of these are quite big field handicaps so I, I tend to look at how they would perform under uh, bigger fields so 
uh, with 16 runners is actually slightly less and with 8 runners and therefore 3 places it's slightly more but in any case there's not really very much difference it's not worth messing about with in my opinion <coughs> so um basically we've got we've got something that looks pretty sound as it is we we're, we're talking about these um these irish raiders uh coming over specifically in handicap hurdles um i think i think it, uh Certainly at the Cheltenham Festival, the Irish have had a, a pretty moderate record in handicap chases over the years, with the exception, of course, of the cross-country chase. Um, so I, I am focusing specifically on the handicap hurdlers here. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I, I may, I, I've got a couple of other ideas about um, the progressive nature of horses as well, um, and, and specifically choosing younger horses. But before I before I go into that, I'm just going to... Um, I'm going to add in these other years uh, and I've not tested this in advance so um, I don't know if this is going to sort of blow up in my face now but <clears throat> let's um, let's try this out so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 2009 and 2012 and I think from memory this was not a great year for the Irish uh, so um, we are about to find out um, so let's so you see the years now we've got 2009 through to 2012 and we'll run the query again and we can see that we've lost a lot of the a lot of the profit there now what I tend to do is if you look at the timeline uh, function this breaks it down by year and what we can actually see is that in point of fact it was only 2011 which carried the can but there are there are a couple of other legitimate um, elements that we can and in my opinion should include the first one is um, this includes all runners uh, regardless of ability um, and regardless of age and it's my opinion that <clears throat> well it's not my opinion it's, it's hard fact that the vast majority of uh, handicap hurdle winners at the Cheltenham Festival certainly and, and to a lesser degree the Aintree Festival um, are younger horses specifically eight or younger so um, this is for obvious reasons you know as you get older your your handicap mark is much better understood and you become what's known as exposed in other words you have a level of form you have a class ceiling a level of form beyond which you can't you can't perform um, so I, I'm going to add in uh, age, if I can find it, here we are, age, and I'm also going to add in odds, um, and because, you know, if a horse is 66 to 1, it's pretty unlikely to have any kind of winning chance, whereas if it's um, 16 to 1, it probably has at least some sort of chance so what I'm going to say is um, the youngest a horse can be to run in a hurdle at Cheltenham is four and even then they tend to only run in the Fred Winter which is the what's called the juvenile handicap hurdle um, and I'm going to go up as old as eight and um, although this could be seven or nine um, you know that to some it's not quite arbitrary but it's not there's there's no science behind it um, and in odds terms, I'm going to say 20 to 1. And again, I could have I could have said 22 to 1 or 25 to 1. I could have said 16 to 1. I'm going to go with 20 to 1, um, which again is it's not arbitrary, but it's it's sort of a an educated guess, if you like, which which may turn out to be not very educated. Um, but again, I, I want to impress upon you the fact that in my opinion and I, and and you know there seems to be strong logic for the inclusion of these elements i'm not i'm not just putting things in willy-nilly um progressive young horses tend to win handicap hurdles at the cheltenham festival and the the fact that they're young and progressive is at least partly understood by the market which means that the top end of the market tends to be successful with such beasts Right, so um, I do hope that this is going to be uh, vindicated by 
what happens next. Um, I'm going to run the old query again, and um, <laughs> well, that's you know that's clearly a lot better. We can see now that we're 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 back up to about still about one in eight, just over maybe towards one in seven strike rate. So it's still a pretty low strike rate. Um, but this is much more profitable and what we've done we've filtered out the no hopers and the exposed horses right and that's that's you know of course you want to do that you want to get rid of the horses that have got no chance of winning and you want to get rid of those that um that um we know how good they are and we know exactly uh um whether they can win or not um so let's have a look at the timeline on that just to get a feel for the year by year and we can see here that um, at SP we would have made a small loss in 2009 um, a small profit in 2010 and 12 and a, and a big profit in 2011 now the first thing to say is that we've we've um, we've lost um, quite substantial losses by cutting out these no hopers which is great the second thing to say is that backing horses at this sort of price uh, on Betfair or using best odds guaranteed is going to improve this position quite considerably. And let me um, let me illustrate that now. We can look at the qualifiers um, tab, and that will show us all of the qualifiers. Uh, uh, and in actual fact, we can download those if we want to. But in this case, I don't need to do that. And you can see that Tona Duderi was second at seven to one. <laughs> that that horse, in fact, should have won the race. Um, Sailor's One was third. Uh, Alderwood won at twenty to one, um, which is obviously great. Um, but let's just use that as an example. I'm going to go to another tab here, and I'm going to look at. Um, let me show you the uh, web address. This is form dot horseracing dot betfair dot com forward slash horse racing I have it saved as a bookmark because it's quite a mouthful and not easy to remember um, and this is a great place to find out what Betfair SPs have been so if I look at the horse Alderwood uh, trained by Thomas Mullins in Ireland he is an eight-year-old I can see that his Cheltenham run uh, was here and um, he had an industry SP of 21, which is 20 to 1. And he had a Betfair SP of 30, which is 29 to 1. So if we think about that in the context of the results we had um, with the timeline, we can see straight away that our four-point profit at SP, we can add another nine points to that because... Um, the SP was the Betfair SP was 30, right? So um, we've had 17 bets and 30 points return. So we've made a net profit of 13 points on just a handful of bets there. Now um, I'm not going to do this for um, for all of them, but I'll just use one of the. Uh, just find if I press the right button, I'll just find um, one of the the qualifiers from last year to exemplify that as well so if we go down here we've got um, star of Aragon um, there just noticed something else actually um, this is what I haven't done which the keen, keener eyed amongst you will have spotted is um, I haven't selected the months of March and April which is when the Cheltenham and Aintree festivals are so I'm just going to quickly add month and um, hope <laughs> that the results still show promise so if I run the query now and we can see in actual fact that the um, strike rate is slightly higher and everything else is pretty much as it should be. Um, let's have a look at that timeline again. And um, <clears throat> we see that all of the years are now in, in partial profit. And again, you know, if we go back to the 2009 and 10 years and have a quick look at those, um, 
I want to illustrate the value of using um, uh, Betfair SP rather than um, starting price. Right, so let's let's find right. The first winner is called Ninetieth Minute. Let me just copy that for expediency's sake. And um, if I search for that horse, when did it run? It ran on the eleventh of March, two thousand and nine. Here we are. Tom Taff trained. He's nine now. He was uh, six, I guess, at the time. Um, so if we find that race, here we are. Eleventh of March. That's the chap. I need to get another hamster in the wheel on my computer. A bit slow today. Um, in actual fact, we can see the Betfair SP there is 17.76 or 16.76 to 1. So in that case, it's only two and three quarter points more. But I say only, you know, that's still, um, if you're betting a tenner ago, that's still another nearly 30, 30 quid profit. Um, and then, of course, we've got 1,000 stars won the county hurdle in 2010. Uh, I believe Nina Carberry rode him that day, trained by the magnificent Willie Mullins. And again, we need to go back to the 19th of March 2010, which is here. It was actually Katie Walsh rode him, not Nina Carberry. Uh, and he was uh, 24 on Betfair, so again, another three points over the odds. So small margins, but um, a profitable angle nevertheless. And this, as I say, um, th this is how I do my research. So to recap, uh, I'll start with an idea of an angle, which was that um, the Irish trained horses uh, running on unsuitable ground, which um, conveniently or just by coincidence manages their handicap mark down tend to perform well um, at the Cheltenham and Aintree festivals when they're unleashed on better ground um, clearly we're looking for horses near the top of the market and clearly um, we're looking for the more progressive ones and therefore the younger ones or at least the more lightly raced ones um, so the way I do that is I choose a subset of the years uh, in this case 2010 and 2011 to um, to test the theory and then I expand the the date array to take in um, a period of time before and afterwards and I'm looking for um, a reasonably consistent um, uh, span of winners and losers and profit and loss and um, you know in this case it's clear that um, uh, that one year has skewed the stats um, in fact it was the 2011 where you know there was um, it, that was a great year for this particular angle but we can see that there aren't there aren't a lot of qualifiers and um, you know this this is a great example of a personal system that I would use but I wouldn't tend to share it more widely because it's quite possible that I could have I could bet 17 tenors um, and get you know if that one winner doesn't win then I have no winners and I, I'm 170 in the hole and people are telling me it's a you know stupid or terrible system but for me the way I bet personally I'm absolutely fine with um, a, uh, a system such as this um, the play strike rate lends itself to each way betting as well um, so I hope that's uh, some kind of insight into how to research using, um, in this case, horse race base. We're going to start with an angle, and an angle could be something you've read in um, a magazine, uh, or it might be something you've read in a book. Um, it might be something you've heard on the TV. If you watch, if you're lucky enough to have Racing UK, um, their presenters tend to be quite insightful. Um, certainly. Uh, make comments and suggestions that are far superior to what you might hear on um, Channel 4 
or at the races and um, you know <laughs> I make no apologies to those involved in the other channels I'm afraid uh, in terms of offering food for thought they um, they stop some way short of an acceptable bar to my mind uh, racing UK are excellent and, and occasionally the BBC um, um, uh, throw in something of, of interest to me um, but those are some of the ideas there are places online as well you can go such as smartersig.com or you can read the, the um, some of the blogs at Betfair um, Simon Rowlands is very good um, our own um, uh, Tony uh, is very good too Tony Keenan who writes for Gigi's and of course th there is lots of value on Gigi's itself um, let me just do a, a, a shameless plug here for some of the stuff on Gigi's and how to find it um, if you want to know a bit more about how to bet various different angles that we've got again the hamster in the wheel is uh, having some problems today so um, there's a there's a button at the top here called how to bet and if you um, if you click on that one um, you'll get a number of the tutorial posts that I or somebody else has written uh, so Tony's written this um, punting confessional um, I wrote some stuff in the, the Dante meeting about draw and um, trainers to follow there and various other things um, F further back we've talked about um, the tote tend to follow there's content on how to play the place pot uh, and various other elements in here planning coping with losing runs following people of interest on Twitter uh, there's some great guys to follow on Twitter um, uh, if you want to know who they are <laughs> then use this post here some content on handicap racings there and um, and various other elements my, my computer is in danger of keeling over um, um, uh, th this is obviously an interesting one 10 steps to betting better in fact this is one of the um, I, I think this is a really important uh, post um, if I'll probably link to this under this video this this is a really important um, uh, post about if, you, if you're serious about betting and if you're serious about um, turning a profit from it then this post has massive value I think um, and I hope you agree anyway I'm going off topic and I'm rambling on so I'm gonna close the proceedings now um, I hope that in the course of the last hour and a half or so um, you found something of value uh, in the form analysis uh, or the system analysis um, or even if it's just the tools that I use um, or how to use GG's I hope somewhere within all that um, there's some utility for you um, as I said at the very start if you've got any questions or there's something um, about horse racing betting that you're not sure about leave a comment below and either I or one of the other um, Gigi's readers um, will will help to answer that and to, to carry your knowledge forward with that said I wish you all the best with your betting and um, I will talk to you soon this is Matt Bisogno saying bye for now